Blockchain is a different way of thinking. It's not just a technology. In fact, the technologies have been around a long time. It's a different way of behaving and a different way of thinking. The aviation industry, redistributing wealth with blockchain. The advent of blockchain technology has brought a new vista to airline ticket distribution and a new way for airlines to collaborate and reconnect with their customers. Let's illuminate this change. Brendan McKittrick, Aerobound Limited. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brendan McKittrick, and David Galea Samut is here, and I are the founders of Aeroband, and the Aeroband is the creator of the AeroBlock, the first DLT dedicated to aviation. I'm going to talk about how blockchain can redistribute revenue in aviation. We believe we have quite a, a voyage ahead of us, a very transformational journey. But before I do that, I just want to wind back the clock a little bit. When I first heard of blockchain, uh, those many years ago, it reminded me of an experience I had in a country called Oman. When people were talking about blockchain, what it could do, the, 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 the vast vista of changes it would bring to humanity. So I just want to go back in time to a place in Oman, a village I once visited. I discovered something in this village where these folks had this panacea to all ills. It was the root of the Arak tree, known locally as Miswak. And Miswak, according to the local packaging in this little village, gave you good teeth, it improves memory, cleans your skin, oral hygiene, improves memory. They wrote it twice on the packet, I kid you not. Back pain relief, lush hair, etc. And the last statement on this product was that Miswak cures everything but the debt. So the temptation I want to avoid here is that we won't just fall into the trap of thinking that blockchain cures everything but the debt. So it has its limitations, obviously, but it also, I believe, having said that, it'll be the most transformational paradigm anyone in this room is going to experience in their lifetime. And we've pitched our careers on that. So what are the biggest challenges to the aviation industry? First of all, I'll give you a little taste of the complexity. It's an old industry to some extent, and it's a very, very complex interconnected industry. So my last role was this global CTO, stroke CIO, my wife is here, she used to call me R2D2 because my title used to change so often. So basically I was handling 300 airlines, 100 shipping companies, 30 offices and data centers using 25 products, which was quite a complex setup. And we also supported this, the global settlement systems for IATA known as the BSP and the SIS, the Simplified Interline System, handling about $200 billion of tickets a year. Not tickets that we sold, but we managed them. So it's a very complex industry, not something that people want to tinker with, but it's long overdue an overhaul. So let's look at some of the figures here, just to give you a taste of the, the, the most recent figures, I suppose, for aviation. It's bordering on a trillion dollar business. It's a high cost industry. The asset cost is quite significant. There's up to 160 IT systems deployed in the large airlines. The investment in blockchain is going to go from about 400 million in 2018 to an estimated 7.5 billion by 2023. The revenues per passenger, the average revenue passenger across the industry in 2018 was somewhere short of or just above $130. And you can see on the right there in the passenger, the average profit in the industry was just over $6, which somebody told me once was not enough to buy a Big Mac in Zurich. So that's the profit the industry makes on a single individual traveling, which is quite minuscule if you think about it. And there's reasons for that I'm going to explain. So the first challenge in the industry, and I love this diagram because it shows you the cyclical nature of the industry. This is the world schedule airline net profit since 1970 to 2019. And with the exception there around 2008 where we had the global crash, economic crash, 
it's a very cyclical, you know, five years up, four years down sort of a model. So it's quite predictable. And you can see there the last three years have been steadily declining. And you don't have to be Einstein to figure out that it's probably heading south of the line. Now, the biggest challenge for this cyclical uh, nature of the industry is when you start a project, you have a year investigation, you have a year setting up RFPs, you have a year doing your selection. By the time you've selected the correct incumbent, and by the time you've sort of defined what the project should look like, the industry goes into a slump, and a lot of projects get shelved. So the right time to actually do the planning for these types of projects is in the downturn, believe it or not. The second one is the profitability challenge I alluded to slightly before now. So if you take the figures year to date for 2019, it's just shy of $190 per ticket, the average industry price per ticket, uh, one way. Now, if you represent this as the size of an aircraft, basically fuel costs are 21%, labor costs coincidentally are 21%, all other costs are 55% of that revenue, which leaves a profit of only 3%. It's very, very small. Of course, this is an average, and averages can be you know, interpreted in many ways. But it is a really good indicator how tight the business is. So a modest fuel increase would wipe out that profit. And as we saw in the previous diagram, the industry, it, the, the actual profitability is declining. So even though there's a quarter of a billion extra people flying every year, the actual squeeze on the cost is getting greater. The increase in cross, uh, the, the cost for 2019 is 7.4% is uh, outstripping the actual growth in the industry. So there's also a technology challenge. And if you look at the number of passengers that are booked on the GDS, so the GDS is the global distribution systems. These are the systems that were developed originally to allow the airlines to sell directly to their customers in an automated digital fashion. 44% of all the tickets sold on the global distribution system were sold on core systems that were developed in the 1950s and 1960s. 37% in the 70s and 80s, and 10% in the 1980s and 1990s. And that leaves a minuscule 9%, which was really on the, the front end modern technology. So you can see the challenge that we're faced with this industry. Very old systems that are stubborn to move. And I, I walked into Air France, it's long enough ago to share the story now, in the year 2000. And I came in, I was full of beans, and I said, I've made it. I was offering Air France a chance to give their passengers an ability to check themselves in. A half an hour later, when this straitjacket was finally placed on me and I was being led away to the asylum, I learned my first lesson in aviation. People don't trust new technology necessarily unless they see it running somewhere else. So in effect, it's very hard to sell new ideas into the industry because nobody wants to tinker with aviation. There's an innate belief in aviation that slow change is good because a lot of the leaders in the industry were generally pilots. And pilots are cautious by nature, because failures in the air are catastrophic. So the same philosophy carried all of its way down through the, t the IT systems. If the airlines actually ran their aircraft on the same model, the next flight would probably look something like this. It's a beautiful aircraft, but very, very old. So the emergence of the online booking engines empire. So I think it's worth a, a quick slide just to show you the evolution of where the big enterprise uh, selling systems come from. So in 1956, there was a project called Semi-Automatic Business Research Environment, otherwise known as Sabre. And that was a, a collaboration between American Airlines and IBM. And the idea was, let's automate the ticket selling. The very primitive systems at the time. But the idea was to transform the customer experience on behalf of the airline. Then it was followed by uh, other systems such as Panamax, System 1, Apollo, Amadeus, Worldspan, all the way up to Galileo. So these systems then started to eat up the smaller systems that are there. So Sabre, who's one of the biggest incumbents in the industry, has acquired Fairlogix recently and Radix about two weeks ago. Amadeus has acquired System 1, Navantair, Openjaw, 
and Travel Sky, sorry, Travel Sky has acquired uh, OpenJaw. Travel Sky is a, a Chinese uh, GDS system. And finally, then you have the travel port who consumed some of the smaller systems. So what you really have is an ecosystem that's eating itself, and you're left with three or four large incumbents running on very old technology. It's not the ideal situation, and we intend to change it. And of course, CETA, as some of you who know the industry well would know that it's also for sale. So there's an abundance of technology, but little change. This is the challenge. There's no shortage of technology. And a lot of the speeches I give, I mentioned that technology to me is irrelevant. Once technology works, what's the business outcome? What's the transformation that you're offering? So all of these technologies exist, and change is slow. This is a diagram. You probably can't read the bottom line there, but this is from Ernest & Young. It's applied specifically for fintech. But I think it's a fantastic diagram, because what it does is it measures all of these new technologies in terms of two axes. The bottom axis is the aging of the technology itself. The y-axis is a progressive level of benefit, which goes from proof of concept, point solutions, enterprise solutions, game changer. Now, the, the big takeaway from this is blockchain is a slow mover. Why? It's not a point solution. Proof of concepts are nice. There's lots of proof of concepts, but they go nowhere because they're localized. Blockchain is a different way of thinking. It's not just a technology. In fact, the technologies have been around a long time. It's a different way of behaving and a different way of thinking. Blockchain is focused on community and trust. The two fundamental tenets for civilization. This is a very fundamental aspect of, of blockchain. It's the differentiator. So if you take it in a different assessment, so you look at all of the technologies that are available to us, and we measure them in terms of how they can facilitate trust and how they create community. It's an interesting diagram, because a lot of the technologies really don't bring a huge amount of trust or community. They are functional. Those that bring trust generally don't bring community, and those that bring community generally don't bring trust. So the sweet spot is blockchain. The use of the distributed ledger in aviation, basically there's many use cases that some of us would be familiar with. We think the actual game changer is DLT-based smart contracts. And the qualities of a smart contract align very, very quickly with, uh, closely with aviation. It's having multiple actors who need to collaborate, so essentially competitors who must collaborate. And just to finally wrap that up, this enables the ecosystem to have a business-to-business, peer, -business, peer peer-to-peer settlement ecosystem, which allows all of the actors in the system to interact with each other, including competitors. And also, quite interestingly, the ticketing reunites the airline with their customer. And this is key. And this is what we're doing with the Aeroblock, which has been launched as the first aviation DLT at the summit here in Malta. So I leave you with two thoughts. Wouldn't it be wonderful if airlines sold their products directly to their own customers and contemplate a 10% decrease in costs in the industry gives 150% uplift in profitability? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I went slightly over, but appreciate your audience.